wir kommen zu einem Herrn, dem Secretary General der European Federation of Local Energy Companies, SEDEC. Was heißt das genau, dieses SEDEC? Um, SEDEC vertritt 1500 lokale und regionale Energieproduzentinnen und Energieproduzenten und ist für 100 Millionen Kunden zuständig. Er weiß, wie es in der EU zu und her geht. Er weiß, was funktioniert, was nicht funktioniert, was wir lernen können hier in der Schweiz aus Best Practices, was wir aber auch lernen können aus Fehlern. Und da sind wir sehr gespannt. A European Strategy for Renewable and Decarbonized Gases. Bitte begrüßen Sie Herz de Bloc. Bonjour à tout le monde, good morning to all, good morning everybody, it sounds like a European song contest, but it's not. Um, ich möchte mich zuerst bedanken bei Swiss Power für die Einladung. Um, ich will, um, werde den Rest meiner um, Story auf Englisch machen, um, was für mich ein bisschen leichter. Um, und das Thema, the, the, the topic that I was asked to speak about two years ago, um, because I received the invitation before the COVID pandemic, was about European strategy for renewable decarbonized gases. At that time, we could not know how important the discussion about gases would be that we are in today. Situation is incredibly serious. Um, that's why I could start with telling fairy tales um, about the commission, the commission magician um, who's living in a country by the North Sea, misty hills, rainy, living in an ivory tower, um, who's organizing an energy technology contest every time that he brings out a new package of legislation where we have different candidates. You have Fossila. She's not very good looking, but very generous with gifts. You have Moleculo. He's uh, the new kid on the block. He's still a bit too small to really beat the others, but he's coming. You have Nuclea, promising absolute safety and world peace in the contest. You have Solaro, um, promising free energy. Um, Window, he's the tallest one. And, well, I could continue with a story like this and um, how the commission magician decided at one point to exclude Fossila and Moleculo and to continue the contest only with the electricity candidates. But, um, of course, every resemblance with existing persons is coincidence. Um, but real life is not a fairy tale. And policy choices and investment decisions should not be based on fairy tales or myths. And then when we have to look at European strategy for gases in the broadest sense, I would have to say, what strategy? When we look at the last five years of activity, legislative activity in Brussels, we had the clean energy package that was put on the table in 2016. It was not an energy package. It was an electricity package. It was promised years before that also it would be an electricity and gas package. It was evacuated at the last, very last minute. So there is no stable framework related with renewable decarbonized low carbon gases since then. Then in last year in July, we have the Fit for 55 package. I would say this is an anti-gases package. There is the gas package, which is at most a hydrogen package. And then suddenly now in 2022, we find ourselves at war with our main energy supplier. And then suddenly we're all surprised that we have to look around and see what other gases do we have then. And just as an, an illustration of what happened over time, um, we have the ener energy triangle we have security of supply, we have sustainability, and competitivity. I would like to translate competitivity in affordability, um, because that will come on the forefront. 
When we discussed about the clean energy package, it was all about, as I said already, about electricity, about market, about innovation, um, but with questions on security of supply. If you leave everything to the market, the market can choose to deliver or not to deliver in time or in the targets you have. Then we had the Green Deal. Uh, this was all about sustainability. Almost nothing was mentioned about affordability. In the clean energy package, neither. I have to say, in the Commission proposal, the only thing about affordability for consumers was a report about energy poverty. No measures, nothing. So, then we got a discussion about taxonomy. It's about um, which investments can be considered as sustainable in view of our 2050 targets. I mentioned already the Fit for 55, where for very good reasons um, and essential reasons, uh, energy efficiency um, and through the Buildings Directive, um, there is a, a huge focus on reducing energy needs. Um, renewables Directive, we absolutely need to speed up um, put on the turbo, like was said before, for the development of renewable energy sources. But then, at the same side in the package, you have some questionable measures, like on taxation directive, on a new EU ETS for heating, where electricity, in general, is considered as sustainable. Always. Whatever the source of the electricity. And today, we have about 20 to 30 percent of that electricity that is sustainable, the rest is not for the moment. But still, we consider electricity for all solutions sustainable, and so we should electrify everything. Heating, transport, industry, and this is then, of course, has been supported by a massive electrification lobby. I'm, I'm talking a lot from the Brussels bubble I live in and work in, and it's, it's, it's really massive. I have to say, um, all possible industrial sectors are trying to push gases, in a very broad sense, out of the markets to take places. So there's huge interest uh, at stake. Um, of course, there's nice new technologies. There are heat pumps, electric vehicles, batteries, a lot of geopolitics, geopolit which just can give the example of an NGO, one of the biggest NGOs in Brussels, 100 million euro per year budget, which is not the normal budget for an NGO. Yep, I agree. It is financed by private um, US citizens, very large, very rich families who probably also have um, other interests than purely the environment. And they have um, that specifically that NGO has been um, leading a very aggressive um, anti uh, gases. Um, campaign for years now. So, to our surprise, so we thought, okay, European strategy for renewable and decarbonized gases, as CEDEC since 2016, we have been pleading for such a strategy to evolve from natural gas to renewable decarbonized gases. The words renewable decarbonized gases, we proposed them. The Commission refused them for years. Now they're in the package. It took five years just to accept that we use the wording. But now what we see in the package, a lot of talking about renewable and low carbon uh, gases, but de facto, it can only be about green hydrogen, not about other forms of hydrogen. It's hydrogen only at transmission level, not at the distribution level. A lot of barriers are built in the, the legislative proposal to avoid that hydrogen could develop at the distribution level. Whereas we all know that at the distribution level you have 100% of the households, about 90% of industry is connected to the distribution level. So they're all supposed to switch for everything completely to electrification. When we look at biomethane in the package, biomethane is defined you believe it or not, as a natural gas. This is, of course, not very interesting if you're in the biomethane business, 
that you fall under natural gas, which according to taxonomy is, belongs to the non-sustainable investments. Other curious elements is long-term contracts must stop immediately. Not good, market will take care. So that was December 2021, this gas package. The world has changed with war, and now we see, and we hope, that little by little, maybe some thoughts will change. When we talk about hydrogen, minds are opening up that we should talk about all forms of hydrogen that we can lay hands on. When we're talking about hydrogen, if it should be only for transmission and for energy intensive industry, it's more difficult. Discussions are still ongoing, but probably when there is no natural gas, then maybe also the minds will change. On biomethane, suddenly the commission can announce it can double the capacity of biomethane. So we are asking ourselves, or it's nonsense that you can double it, or why didn't you include it from the start if there is local potential? And finally, the idea of the uh, long-term contracts that had to disappear. Nobody talks about it anymore. We're talking about single buyer buying gas together, long-term contracts for LNG and for others. So with what we saw evolving over, over the last years, so we had talked a lot about markets, innovation, very nice, very fancy, caring less about security of supply, what's a luxury problem, talked a lot about sustainability, but now suddenly we're confronted with two of the more neglected elements, security of supply and affordability. Affordability with energy prices that are reaching levels that we never saw before, and the solutions that are now being put on the table are even worsening the situation. As an answer, the Commission came up with the idea, well, let's have heat pumps everywhere. Um, well, the cost of a heat pump is the same as the average annual income of a European citizen. Just to say, 60 to 70% of the European population can never afford a heat pump because of the houses they live in mostly and because the housing stock is not ready to accept or to work or to give sufficient uh, heat in houses. On security of supply, what are the proposals now coming on the table? Um, more nuclear is one. The question is if that will solve the problem in the longer term. We will import more um, shale gas from the US. We will probably give some exclusivity contract for about 10 years at prices very difficult to predict. So we're finding ourselves in a very difficult situation. And I don't have the answers, of course. Um, the only thing that we can see is um, when we're talking about affordability, then we should focus on what we have. What are existing infrastructures, grid infrastructures that are available today? And are we going to use them? Am I talking about the gas infrastructures? Or are we going to invest massively in electricity infrastructures? Can be a combination of both, of course. Do we need more regulation? More thinking in terms of the general interest? Maybe talking less about market, where shareholders' interests come in the first place. When we talk about security of supply, maximize the local solutions. It's not sexy for the Commission. The Commission likes big companies, simple solutions that are the same for every country, every region, every city in Europe. That's not reality. We have to optimize diversified portfolio of technologies and not go for the silver bullet, which does not exist. We will need molecules. If we like it 
or we don't like it, we need molecules. They have a lot more capacity, ener energetic capacity to offer than electricity. We have a winter peak on energy demand that's about six times higher now covered by gas than is co covered today by electricity. We have no solution for seasonal storage with electricity. So we will need every piece of the puzzle, including molecules. So we hope that finally there will now be a European strategy for renewable and decarbonized gases, because we will need it. The problem is that we have no time anymore now. So we will have to do more with what we have today. To conclude, if we want to progress on this very steep path of decarbonization, and we want and we have to realize climate neutrality, we will need every piece of the puzzle. And we do not have the luxury, like some have been thinking, that we can exclude certain technological options even if they contribute to decarbonization. We don't have the luxury to give preferential treatment to one or two silver electric bullets in the technology beauty contest I started with. How can we maybe solve part of the problem, have more attention for the decentralizing energy systems, which is a reality and again is something that is very difficult to accept for people who think in terms of centralized systems, on TSOs, on very big companies. Decentralizing energy systems are run by citizens, by local energy companies. This is valid for electricity and for gas. And of course, energy efficiency is the most important thing. But besides that, we have absolutely to make the maximum of the local resources and go for integrated approaches. There's a lot of talking about sectoral integration from the Commission. They made a very nice communication after we insisted for about 10 years that we are doing it already for 30 years at local level. And now the only element in the gas package on sectoral integration, it, the title is sectoral integration, is how you can integrate as much renewable electricity in an electricity grid. That's the only thing about sectoral integration in the current proposal. So that could be done better. Then finally, diversity within the EU is huge. Same for diversity within member states. And this requires subsidiarity. Subsidiarity is a word we normally only use from the EU level to the member states. EU should not impose detailed rules that are the same for everybody because the realities are different. They're hugely different. The points of departure are different. The potential resources are different. Wealth is different. So what we can expect from European Union and from member states is that they create a momentum, a political momentum to act, and that they set the goals. They have to do that. But then the choices should be left to the regional and the local level to choose the optimal tools and to make the implementation on the ground. Because it's very easy to um, invent nice schemes that do not work in reality and given the urgency, the, the absolute urgency we're confronted with today, also this we can no longer afford. Thank you very much. Gert de Blok. Ich weiß, Sie sprechen auch perfekt Deutsch und haben von Bundesrätin Sumaruga natürlich auch alles mitbekommen, but we're sticking to English for, for a quick couple of questions. Um, I got to know you as an amazing diplomat, but at the same time as a pragmatist that actually brings things to the point, especially when not in a very public setting on an individual basis. Um, we are somewhat on an individual basis. Give us, and you know, in Switzerland, we're great diplomats. We always, we're able to wrap things in really nice words and be very respectful. Can you bring it to the point and tell us, you know, what, what is it that we need to do? 
What is it that we need to avoid at all costs in order not to run um, into the same difficulties as the EU? It's off the record in here. Oh, oh, of course, no, of course. <laughs> that, that was absolutely clear. This is a private, <laughs> private talk, so I can say whatever I want. Um, I would say stop dreaming. Um, not about the goal, of course, um, but about the shiny road that we'll, we will go together to get there. Um, I think, the, maybe repeating myself with what I said, but I think affordability will be a huge issue. And affordability, mainly for citizens, how they can change their heating, their mobility into more sustainable ways. I have no answer on that, except that imposing the most expensive solutions will not help. I just give the example of the heat pump, I already gave it. It's not the silver bullet. We will have to see country by country, region by region, what, which heating appliances exist, which mobility is needed. It will be totally different in cities than it will be in rural areas. It will depend on the presence of existing grid infrastructures, be it for district heating or gas or electricity, how much potential you have um, and, and, and to make things more affordable. Then the second is use what you have to get what you want. I mean, there are existing infrastructures that are now proposed to be closed down. I take the example of the gas infrastructure that could perfectly be used. In most cases, uh, we're going into very deeply now in the technical research at the EU level with, with companies and, 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 and a project. 90% of the grids can be perfectly used for sustainable gases be it biomethane or hydrogen. The current proposal of the gas package tries to break down this whole sector. This is about competition in markets. And again, we think this would be an incredible waste. So use what you have, not only in terms of infrastructures, but also local resources. We can do, I think, a lot more um, with the local resources. I gave the example of the biomethane. Um, also, sectoral integration is something that is not used enough. And a third point, um, we need to invest heavily in sustainable molecules. We need molecules. Be it biomethane or hydrogen, um, with biomethane it's a lot more easy to, on a short term, already progress a lot more. Um, but we need seasonal storage with renewables. I have solar panels on my roof, um, but I know very well that from November till end of February, production is zero, so if I have to heat with electricity for my solar panels, I will have to buy some extra blankets. So um, <laughs> that will not make it. Good. We might need to invest in extra blankets then, so yeah. that, that might be a good point then. <laughs> Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for your considerations. Herzlichen Applaus, Gert de Block. Thank you. Hold on one second. Oh. We have a very little light for you <laughs> to take back to the EU. It is solar powered and uh, it's definitely going to work in summer and for the cold days, get that extra blanket. Thank, Thank you. you so much. <laughs> Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you. Kerte Blocks. Dankeschön.